and welcome to Frame for Light. I'm Dave Kelly. The purpose of this program is to help viewers develop a greater appreciation for both the art and the science of photography. In today's program, we're going to talk about how we add depth and distance and also drama in our photography. But before we get started on today's main topic, I'd like to do a recap of the previous episode, which was episode two. So in episode number two, we talked about how light can reflect, it can also refract or bend. And as a result of this ability to refract or bend light, we developed lenses. And lenses are used to bend or refract light, and they also converge that light to a focal point. And this is really important because if you can't focus light, there really is no point in photography. We have to be able to control the light, manipulate the light, and bring all of those points of light to a focal point um, to make those images really meaningful. All right, so as we go along through the recap here, we also talked about the aperture controlling and regulating the light that comes into the camera. Now this works similar to the way that the pupil works in the human eye. We talked last week about the fact that the pupil is uh, required to either contract if you have an abundance of light or to dilate or expand when there is not enough light and you need more light to come in in order to allow you to see the existing scenery as well as possible. And the example we used was standing outside at a Saturday matinee movie in the ticket line. The sun is very bright, so the pupils are contracted. Then when you walk into the, th into the theater, it's very dark. Your eyes have to adjust, and so your pupils have to dilate. So that's how apertures work. Now, f-stops control depth of field. Now first we should define again what we mean by depth of field. Depth of field is the way we measure the amount of material in the image that's actually in sharp focus. And that again is important as we talked about earlier about focusing light. So depending upon the type of aperture, excuse me, what type of f-stop you're using, it will affect the depth of field. And so with a wide open depth of field, such as Four, an f-stop of four with a 100 millimeter lens, or if you're using a 50 millimeter lens, it would be an f-stop of two, you're going to have very shallow depth of field, meaning that only the subject that you're focusing on will be in sharp focus. Everything else will probably be out of focus. Now, if you have an abundance of light and you're able to stop down or uh, close down, that f-stop, then with an f-stop of say 16 or f-22, you're going to have a great deal of depth of field. It's going to be very deep. In fact, you might have depth of field to infinity. Okay, and then we also talked about the shutter in last week's episode, and the shutter speed controls and affects motion. And it does this by regulating the amount of time that the shutter is actually open and allowing light to pass through the lens. And if you're going to shoot action photography, such as sports or lots of moving um, participants in the photo, you're going to want a very fast shutter in order to capture that without motion blur. And a fast shutter is 1 500th of a second or 1 1,000th of a second. If what you're shooting actually is stationary and nothing is moving, then the shutter speed doesn't really matter and you can have a slower shutter speed and it won't be a problem. Well, that's the end of the recap, so let's go ahead and get started with a new concept today, which is diffraction. Now, we talked about reflection, and we also talked about refraction, which again is bending of light. So diffraction is a new concept where we talk about light rays splitting apart and going into tiny little spaces. And the best way to illustrate this is to use an example of paper and paper moving over a sharp edge, such as a razor blade or maybe an X-Acto knife. So you know when you pass a piece of paper over that sharp edge, it could split that paper in half. Well, if you take that concept and apply it to light rays, the same thing is happening. And the best example of this is when we use telescopes. And when we look through telescopes at distant stars, we will see often what people refer to as a starburst effect. Or in the case of the Star of Bethlehem, we know every Christmas on the Christmas cards we see the Star of Bethlehem and it's represented with that long tail. Well, that's called a diffraction spike. And that diffraction spike is caused by when light goes into the telescope and it hits the two support veins or four support veins that hold up the secondary mirror in the telescope and the light can't get around those support veins and so it splits apart and 
disperses, causing that effect, which we see as the long tail on the star of Bethlehem or starbursts on stars that we look through in telescopes. Now in photography, we have a similar phenomenon known as lens flare. And it's similar to diffraction because it affects recording. It also involves light coming into the lens and reflecting and bouncing around between lens elements and creating an image. Now the good thing about lens flare is that we can actually use it creatively to our advantage. Now lens flare usually only occurs when you're pointing the camera toward the source of light without a lens shade or without what's called a lens hood. And uh, this lens flare is because there's too much light coming from the source, from the sun, for example, and it overwhelms the lens's ability to focus that light. And so that light, again, is bouncing around in between the lens elements or the glass elements in the camera. So here's an example of it right here. Uh, you can see that this is an Egyptian um, tomb. It's actually a replica of an Egyptian tomb. And you see the lens flare at the top of the frame there. There's a series of uh, light circles. They're actually hexagonal because the aperture is a six-bladed aperture in the camera, so it always mimics the kind of uh, aperture that you have. And so you see those spots at the top of the frame, and they're actually appropriate in this particular case from a creative standpoint because we're talking about an Egyptian tomb. The Egyptians were into mysticism and things of that nature, so this seemed an appropriate creative complement to the photo. Also, Egypt was located in the desert where it's very hot, they get a lot of sun, and so this sort of indicates or implies that this is uh, perhaps a place where we get a lot of sun. So that's an example. Here's another example that we're looking at here with the Capilano Suspension Bridge in Canada. It's a little harder to see on this one, but if you look at the very top of the frame in the center part, you can see some little circles. Uh, they're wider than the ones that we saw in the previous image, but they're definitely there. And that shows that we're getting some lens flare. And you can tell that we're pointing in the direction of the sun because the sun is in the upper left part of the frame. And having those lens flares actually adds to the drama of this particular photo. Also, there are a couple of trees that look like they're about to fall over on the left-hand side of the frame, which also adds drama to this particular image. So how do we add drama to our photography? Well, one of the ways we, what we want to do is create drama, distance, and depth. And in the process of creating drama, distance, and depth, we have to utilize tools that are available to us. And one of those tools is using diagonal lines. And here we see a diagonal line of that suspension bridge because people are progressing diagonally across that frame, which does add a sense of drama here. Now those diagonal lines and relationships, when I say diagonal relationships, I mean things that are diagonally coordinated so that they seem to match up relationship-wise. We are adding a sense of distance and depth and creating a more dramatic impact when people look at it. Now diagonal lines and relationships work because they put the Z into the X and Y, as I like to say. And X and Y refers to the Cartesian coordinate system, which is the y and the x axes. And the y axis is the vertical axis and the x axis is the horizontal axis. Now this was developed by the philosopher and mathematician Rene Descartes in 1637. And if you remember your history and your philosophy, Rene Descartes once said, I think, therefore I am, which proved his existence. But he also thought a lot about the Cartesian coordinate system as well. And that's how he came up with this, which is the basis for analytic geometry. But we use it in photography by adding a z-axis, or the diagonal axis, which is also used in 3D applications, to create that sense of depth. Because we do have a two-dimensional medium in photography, and we have to add depth by integrating that diagonal line, or the z-axis. Now, diagonal lines and relationships compel the eye to travel across the frame. And that's the beauty of diagonal lines it forces the viewer to be, become an active participant in the photography. And so when we force viewers to become active participants in the photography, they're more engaged. They have to analyze the photo. They will follow that line, that diagonal line, all the way across the frame and see where it leads. They will also have to make some judgments and, and make some sort of thought process work as far as those relationships in that image if you're utilizing those diagonal lines and relationships. So here's an example of 
uh, a diagonal line and a sense of depth and distance with this train. There's also another principle at work here, which I'm going to get into in just a moment, called linear perspective. But we'll save that for just a moment. Right now, we're going to take a look at the diagonal direction of that train tra traveling across the frame. And also, you'll notice that across from the train, there's a diagonal relationship with a green car. And if you can see this, there's actually a man sitting on the hood of that green car. He's waiting for that train to pass so he can drive across the other side of the road. Now, the reason he's sitting on the car is because this train is going to take a long time to get past. It's a tourist train. It's going very slowly, and as you can notice, there are people hanging out the window, some people even sitting on the windows in the train, and so it's a tourist train. It's going very slowly. Everyone's having a good time, so we're creating a sense of drama by showing those people hanging out of the window and the train traveling in that diagonal line and other things like the green car as a diagonal relationship, which makes the eye pass all the way across that frame. Now, here's another example of how we can use diagonal lines to direct the eye line. If you notice, here's a wharf. We see the pier on the right-hand side. That's the largest image in the frame is that pier. That pier leads us diagonally to the, where the wharf is, and then above the wharf, we have the skyline. And then on the left side of the skyline, if you can see it in your image, we have a construction crane, which actually has the beam of the crane leading diagonally up into the sky. So again, we're directing the eye and we're going from one diagonal line on the lower right-hand side to another diagonal line on the upper left-hand side. Now here's the Hearst Castle, the famous swimming pool at the Hearst Castle. And you'll notice here we have sculpture objects which are in a diagonal relationship. On the lower right-hand side, you see that white sculpture which is very prominent in the frame. But across the pool diagonally, you'll see another mirror image of that sculpture on the other side. And that diagonal relationship attracts our interest because both of them are sculpture pieces and both of them are bright white and they're the brightest things in the frame. So the eye does go diagonally across the pool to match up that diagonal relationship. Now here's the same pool but without the object in the uh, foreground on the right. But in this case, we're using the diagonal lines in the pool to actually lead the eye across the pool over to the other side. So we're using that grid pattern to lead the eye across. And behind that sculpture on the other side, you can see the distant hills. So we're creating a sense of depth with that as well. Now let's talk about linear perspective for a moment. We mentioned that earlier with the, the train. And what we mean by linear perspective is we're taking a look at two parallel lines that appear to converge at a vanishing point in the distance. And in reality, those lines are always parallel. They're never going to merge, but it's just an optical illusion that as we recede into the, into the distance, those lines seem to get closer and closer together. And with railroad tracks, this is um, a phenomenon that's very common. You see railroad tracks that appear to be parallel, but they seem to be moving closer and closer together in the distance, like they're going to merge at that vanishing point. But we know that's not the case. So intellectually, we have to let our mind overcome what our eyes are telling us. There's a famous adage, what do you believe, what I'm telling you or what you see with your lying eyes? Well, what I'm telling you right now is to believe what I'm telling you and don't believe your lying eyes because they're not telling you the truth. And here's an example. Uh, this is a, a highway, a two-lane highway, and you can see that um, as it goes off into the distance, that two-lane highway looks awfully small. Does that mean that the two-lane highway becomes a one-lane highway and then eventually becomes non-existent in the vanishing point? No, that's not what happens. What happens is it remains a parallel line all the way into the distance. And you can see that the road travels in a diagonal direction across the frame. And also on the left side of the road, you see some telephone poles that also recede uh, as they go into the distance, and there's a diagonal line uh, receding into the distance. Now, another aspect of a shot like this that's interesting is that you capture the ambience of what you're looking at. Now, this is uh, photographed in the Midwest in the summertime, and during that time of year in the Midwest, you never know when a big storm is going to develop in the middle of the afternoon. In the morning, it could be clear, a clear blue sky and a nice day. 
and then for some reason in the middle of the afternoon the clouds gather and form and you never know if there might be a big rainstorm or a hailstorm or something worse like a tornado as we see in the Wizard of Oz. Well in this particular uh, case it rained and then it hailed and then there was a tornado warning but fortunately the tornado never materialized but you can get, get all of that in this photograph by showing uh, the distance going off into the distance leading up into those clouds that are forming and are also very threatening. Okay, here's uh, yours truly standing on a road, a country road. There's a cornfield on the left and I'm on this country road where obviously the edges of the country road are parallel where I stand but they sure look like they recede and converge in the distance there. Well, again, here's an example of linear perspective where we have to use the mind to overcome what our eyes are telling us. And so that's the beauty of photography, as I was talking about earlier, when we force the viewer to become a participant in the photography, in the viewing of this photograph, you have to, again, tell your eyes, no, those lines are not actually converging, it just looks that way. It's an optical illusion because of, in a two-dimensional photograph like this, everything recedes into the distance and appears to merge at the vanishing point, but that's not really what's happening. Okay, here's an example of people walking up a drawbridge into a fort, and you can see that the same principle applies here. The drawbridge appears wider um, at the, in the foreground than it does in the background as they're climbing up but we know that that drawbridge is going to be parallel all the way up. Also, in terms of using diagonal lines, you'll notice with the drawbridge, there's a chain on the upper right-hand side of the photograph that swings down into the frame, and also on the left-hand side, you can see the other chain coming down from the left. Now, here is uh, the fort as you're standing on the drawbridge and you look out across. This is an example of a diagonal relationship. You've got a relationship between the, the outer wall, which is in the lower right-hand part of the frame, and then when you look to the left of that outer wall, you see that green grassy area, which used to be a moat. And that moat is where the drawbridge covers. And on the other side of the moat, of course, is the main fort. And you see that there's a watchtower on the corner of that fort. So let's go inside that fort and take a look. Do you see any diagonal lines represented here? Yes, we have a stairway that goes up to the right and then it uh, hits a landing and then it turns left and stairs go on up to the top. And we also have a nice shadow that's uh, falling down the stairway on the right hand side. So you've got uh, two diagonal lines with the stairways that uh, bisect one another. Okay, when we get to the landing and then go on up to the top in the second set of stairs, you see that the railing is captured here on the right-hand side in a diagonal progression. It's a very dramatic way to capture that stairway and climbing up the stairway and then we can still look into the courtyard. So again, we want to use diagonal lines to create a sense of drama in our photography. Okay, now we're at the top of the stairs and now we can look to the left and we can see down, going down the stairs that we just came up with that diagonal line. If you look closely across there's a, a diagonal relationship across on the other wall. There are a couple of cannons uh, that are positioned to point out of the holes in the crenellated wall on the top of the fort. And we'll take a look at that a little more closely in a moment. But uh, also on the right-hand side, we see that the, um, there's a diagonal line of the stairwell or the railing of the stairwell, and there's some erosion going on there which gives us uh, information about the fact that this is a very old fort and there has been some erosion here. Okay, now we're looking through one of those uh, crenellated turrets or one of the holes in the, in the wall that's uh, the crenellated wall of this uh, fort and we're looking out through there and we can see a diagonal line uh, that's just in the middle of where we look through that hole in the wall and that diagonal line is the outer wall that's falling apart. Bricks have fallen out of it, so now it's actually forming a diagonal line, and you, it's hard to see because it's very small, but there's a gentleman in a light blue shirt that's standing at the base of where that diagonal line is. And then above uh, that particular wall, there's the water, and if you look out on the water, it's uh, rather small, but you can see that there's a drawbridge, and the drawbridge is open so that either side of the drawbridge is facing up in a um, diagonal line. Okay, now this is at the top of the fort, and 
we're finding a corner of that four-walled courtyard. And so we put the uh, external part of what I call the vector of the corner piece in the center of the frame. And so we have the external vector there with one side of the wall going in a diagonal line to the left and the other side going off in a diagonal line to the right. And then if we look across the courtyard, we see on the other side there is a watchtower. And there is the watchtower. And this is in the internal side of the V vector of uh, the four walls of that fort. Now, you see in this case, the wall on the left of the watchtower is taller than the wall on the right. And that's an asymmetrical relationship, which actually looks kind of interesting in this case. Now, that watchtower was used by the soldiers in the fort to look out over the water to make sure there weren't any invading navies coming in to the fort and there weren't any pirates of the Caribbean. That's a true story. They, they had lots of, uh, lots of pirates in the Caribbean in those days. Okay, now here's an example of one of the cannons pointing out of one of those uh, holes in the wall. And this one, the horizon line is not exactly level. But the shot is very dramatic because we're following that diagonal line of that cannon barrel. Now, if you're a purist and you like to see all of your horizons completely flat and level, maybe you don't like this perspective. On the other hand, if you like action and drama, you might actually like the way this looks. I'll leave that up to you. Okay, here's an example of a gateway to that city that we're in. And the gateway has the two pillars, and there is a diagonal relationship here. Now, we probably know intellectually that those, the, the two pillars are the same height. But by the way we photographed it, it looks like the one on the left is taller than the one on the right because there's a diagonal progression here from height, the higher uh, pillar on the left to the shorter pillar on the right. But again, if you shoot them from the from dead center in the front, they're probably the same size. But this makes it more interesting to look at the pillars when you take that type of angle. And if we go to the Hearst Castle, you can see the same sort of effect. The Hearst Castle has the two bell towers. Of course, they're the same height, but when we photograph it in this manner, it looks like the one on the left is taller, but it's just because of that um, diagonal relationship there. Now, people always ask me, how do I take photographs of buildings so that they're more interesting and more compelling because when I go out and photograph buildings from the front, they're always sort of flat and rather boring. They're, they're not interesting to look at. And so I use examples like this to say, well, find a different angle. Find an angle that isn't common, that isn't straight on, where you have some ability to create a sense of depth and to create some distance and maybe even create some drama when you look at it. Now, diagonal lines are often found in architecture. Um, especially in roof lines. So if you're uh, fond of shooting architecture, you can always find diagonal lines in uh, roof lines. And if they're not there, you can actually create them by how you position the camera. Let's take a look at some examples. Now this is at the Hearst Castle, and in this case, the roof line that you see on the left uh, is fairly dramatic in terms of coming in from a diagonal perspective there. But that, that roof line is actually flat. Um, it's a flat roof. But because I was underneath and looking up, and from the angle that I chose, it looks like a diagonal line. And it comes in and takes a bend around that, uh, that uh, castle, or whatever that is, the tower, I guess it would be called, in the middle. And then as it comes around, it goes off on a diagonal line going off screen to the right. And so just by positioning and where you are down below, looking up, you can create that diagonal perspective. Now this is another example of a roof that uh, because of the way I've positioned the camera, it looks like there's a very dramatic diagonal line there. And also above that diagonal line of the roof is the gabled window that has the two sides of the diagonal lines of that gable. So in that case, again, the house is not uh, set on a hillside where it's facing outwardly diagonally, but because of the positioning of the camera, it looks like it's a diagonal line and it's very dramatic. So if we go to this shot, we see the same type of house and we see that it, it is on flat ground and the roof line is pretty dramatic here too if you see how the roof line reaches a point 
at the top of the frame. And then we can tell that the sun is coming from the upper left uh, part of the frame because the light is coming through and it's backlighting that palm tree, which looks very beautiful. We talked about that a bit last week when we talked about how backlighting can really make plants and trees and leaves look really beautiful and stunning, as it does here. Okay, now this is the John Steinbeck house in Salinas, and you can see that those Victorian-style homes or Edwardian-style homes are quite beautiful because they do have lots of use of diagonal lines and triangles and geometric shapes. There's even a conical-looking tower there on the right. Um, so everywhere you look, there seems to be some sort of angle, triangle, diagonal line, or something of interest. Now here's the Winchester House in San Jose, and there you can see that we have lots of um, diagonal lines. Everywhere you look, there seems to be a diagonal line with the roof line and with the gables, and, and even the window progression you see on the left-hand side seems to follow a diagonal line. Also, I would uh, point your attention to the right-hand side of the frame where even when a shadow comes in, it forms a diagonal line, so it's very convenient. Now, this is another example of a craftsman-style home where the roof lines are very dramatic, and so you want to take advantage of those roof lines when they support uh, the idea that uh, diagonal lines and diagonal relationships create drama in your photography. Okay, here are a couple of buildings in Seattle at the Boeing Airplane Company, the, the Aircraft Museum. You can see there's a wooden structure on the left and then there's a glass and steel structure on the right. Both are taking advantage of architecture that involves a lot of diagonal lines. So if we go inside, we see that the airplanes in the glass and steel structure are flying in a diagonal progression. And why? Because I think it's a lot more dramatic if we see them flying across the screen diagonally than if we just film them from the front or from the side. And so another use of diagonal progression with objects. We've got a couple more here. This is a dinosaur that uh, is standing there and because of uh, the position of the camera from underneath, there's a very um, dramatic diagonal line from the nose to the tail on that dinosaur. Okay, a couple more. This one is an um, object outside that uh, museum that we were looking at earlier, the Egyptian uh, replica museum. In this case, we've got um, a diagonal line created by that shadow. Okay, and here we have lighting um, that's being used. Uh, this is a light structure that's inside a building where we have that internal vector that's demonstrating um, uh, the use of diagonal lines. And this is our last image of the day. Even we when we photograph people, we want to photograph diagonal relationships between the photographer and the object that's being photographed. Well, that's it for today's program. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Frame for Light, and I hope you can utilize some of these principles in your own photography. Join us again next time when we'll talk more about how to utilize the entire frame in your photography work. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. I'll catch you next time. Thank you.